Lee, um, Fab Five Lee, did he conceptualize it? Did he was how deep would it within the the the, the um, background? Did he get into the calculations and how to do stuff? What was going on? What um, car, etc. How how deep did that go in conceptualizing? But he al- he always pictured it in his mind what it was going to be like. So every year, you know, they discussed it. Or he already had it pictured in his mind. <laughs> so automatically, the set of car was going to be the Fabulous Fire car. That's the one that had the Mickey Mouse on it. <laughs> he already had the vision of what it was going to be like. And him telling us that we all had the vision of what it was going to be like. Once we knew we were going to all do it, the Fabulous Fire, we already knew. And what the concepts were, and we just went and did it. And you wouldn't believe... We had so much paint to get into this layout. We had and it was suitcases and everything. Was it just the five of you, six of you? Was there a, someone looking out? What was the break down the, the pattern and how it how it all came about? I happened to come by Lee House and I was there. So me, Lee and Mono went. We went there first. Mm-hmm. We had all this paint. It was just his Lee mother made us sandwiches. That's how crazy that was. So what? we run it out with. Wait, hold, on, hold on, honey. You might be hungry. Here's some sandwiches. Was that uh, <laughs> yeah, sandwiches, crackers? It was it was ridiculous, yo. My <laughs> mother wouldn't have made shit for us. <laughs> she said, "Just don't call me if you get caught." That's all she would have said. Killer, killer, podcast. KillerKellerOfficial.com You need the Kellervision app. 24-7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top fives, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Yo, Nolan Poland Records for underground classics. NoPolandRecords.com Instagram UK Frontline Fox created. Killer Keller. And we're here to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller Podcast. Three, two, one. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller Podcast, live and direct, central London for me, or as central as you need to be. Big shout out to graffitikings.co.uk, hold tight, strainstation.co.uk, and uh, noelpolandrecords.com. It's a fine day. I hope you got yourself the Television app free download, music and street culture, that sport in arts business. You ain't getting nowhere else in the world. This is the place. It's the place to be, okay? Um, yo, to cut it finally, because we have ourselves one hell of a legacy guest right here. We're going over across the Atlantic to the East Coast to a gentleman that pretty much first generation to the whole of the graffiti scene. And we're talking pre-hip-hop. We're talking early 70s. Yeah, we're talking Lee Mono, Doc Slave Slug. We're talking Fab Five. We're talking the first whole trains. We are talking to the mighty slave Fab Five. What are you saying, my brother? Hey, what's going on? I'm glad to be here. Yo, I am bugging (laughs) out. (laughs) Yo, and just listen, to, to any of the untrained, yeah, He's making this look very simple. This is the first time he's used Zoom. Is this the first podcast you've done? Yes, it is. I'm just trying to get a, a grip on it, but hey, I'm liking it so far. Yeah, 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 yeah. Totally, totally. Once it's it's like it's like it's like a box of Pringles, man. Once you pop, you can't stop. Right. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, sir? What's going on? Yeah, I'm good. Everything's all right. You've been, you've been keeping well. Everything's good with yourself. Yeah, yeah. I've been trying to, you know. As you get older, you know, you got all the little hurts here and there, but um, I'm dealing with it. I'm good. Yeah. And what, the, the, the kind of hurts and ailments of, like, you know, a regular human being, or are we talking about, like, a extra proficient um, old school graffiti, right, of his time kind <laughs> of ailments? All them bending down and climbing on trains and all that. Catching up right now. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Listen, I mean, your history is steeped of an era um, predating many of the things that we saw as import coming in into the rest of the world. Um, one of the things that I'd certainly like to bring a spotlight on um, is the fact that a lot of what we saw with Style Wars, Wild Style, Subway Art, etc. I mean, there's a lot of this that they send a, a salute to the late 60s and the graffiti writers of its time. But then there's these huge chunks of information that it kind of disappears right up to like 
I don't know, 1981, 82, you know, all of a sudden we get this later information, but there was a whole era that pretty much wasn't documented by the people that were sending over the information for its time, right? Right. It would be awesome for you to explain a little bit, just very briefly indulging in that classic era, that original era that spawned so many of the writers that we know more commercially from the 80s onwards. All right. Well, see, when I started in like 75, you know, um, I was like on the the end tail of like Cliff, Tracy, Peanut, Mm -hmm. and like those writers from my era, we like took what, what they were doing we put some little twists and arrows and all that. Kind of like got into more of the real like letter bending yeah. for like 75, 76 to like the 80s. And but after 80, I quit. So I don't yeah. know what happened after that because I had got a car and I wasn't dealing with graffiti. But, but my era, we just basically the foundation before us and we just took the, lit- the letters and bent them and twist them, add some arrows, cuts, and all that to it. And then it ended up like a a little battle of, of originality. And that's how I got to what the real wild style was. Yeah, you guys were pretty much the people that created that of its time. You were the era definers of that of the movement that has now become the, the archetype um, DNA of graffiti, mm-hmm. even now. Right. Does, yeah, it, does, does that bug you out? Like the, the fact that these, yeah. you know, more innocent ideas or rather battle-esque, you know, we're going to fucking take this, you know, take this to the street, take this to the trains uh, for its time has suddenly just, it's just evolved and not stopped and kept going. See, what got me is after I quit in 80, I wasn't watching no trains. In 84, I, I moved to Florida. And I, had, I was dealing with no graffiti at all. And when I came back in 2010, like I was kind of like amazed at the development it went through. Mm. But still, basically, the, they what they would what they're doing now is like a, a update of what we were doing then. For sure. It, you know, when they got more precise caps and low pressure cans and everything, so you know, it's like a like a more of a fine art now. Mm. But it's still basically from what we were doing, experimenting for. From 75 to 80, with all the originality we were trying to do, it's like just, it manifested itself into what it is now. Yeah, it really did, didn't it? We'll get yeah. into this Florida trip that you decided to take yourself on, and we'll get into the other extra um, awesome hobbies that you have in the form of drag racing and dragsters and all that sort of stuff. We'll get into these conversations. But Oh, you know about that, huh? Come on, son. I do my research. <laughs> I got your number, pal. <laughs> but let's get in, let's get into let's get into of its time because you know we we're talking about somebody that didn't just like you know he didn't just join the Fab Five and then do like a, a whole train Christmas car. You know what I mean? He didn't just you know just didn't come out of nowhere. You used to write. You you wrote. Um, a couple of different pseudonyms before, like Pad Two and and names like that, didn't you? Yeah. Well, when I first started, you know, like with some friends around my around my way, they were doing it first. <laughs> they were going into the Kingston layoff and doing pieces and stuff, and you know, I kind of liked it, so they were telling me about it, telling me about it, so I had to try one day. But anytime I went into Kingston layoff. With them going before me, they used to break the windows and all kind of stuff, and it got hot. So every time I went in there, I got chased out by the police. Mm. But it was just like fascinating to me because already in my neighborhood, they had um everybody tagging on the wall with with the ex vandals and the and the vanguards and all of that. So you know, just 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 piqued my curiosity. But it just made me like I wanted to see how this is done and and what what this is really about. But um, in my neighborhood, I had a writer named Falcon 789. And um, one of my friends took me to his house. And once I seen his black book, I was hooked. Really? What was the black book yes. like? That must have been nuts. That must have uh, drawn you in. Yeah, that was like 75, 74. The, the, the letters that he was doing, it just looked like fascinating to me. 
Because it wasn't like Thorpe letters, they were like fancy letters, all put together. And with the colors and and the, the outlines of the letters, it just blew my mind. I, I, just I just couldn't keep it out of my mind when I first started writing. Really? What was the environment like? What was the environment like for that time in terms of, because obviously there was, there clearly sounds like there were some squads, there was security, there was people that were trying to prevent activity happening on the trains or vandalism but what was the what was the what was the what was the tone and temperature like for someone that wanted to go and paint the train at the time no well they um they had the little graffiti squads and all that when i first started i really didn't know about them but as i got up a little bit the main ones on irt were hickey and ski hmm. and they was um they were like they called themselves like a graffiti squad but no matter how many people you have in a graffiti squad, you can't be everywhere on every line. Nah. So what they were trying to do was like maybe like trying to catch the the main riders on the lines, but they'll bust like toys for them to inform because they'd be so scared they don't really know what to do to try to inform and see what they know about the the elite riders on the line. Really? So, so like, there used to be some snitching going on. They used to be a lot. Oh, of- yeah. As, I, as I've been hearing, you know, when I first got into it, I heard her story. Everybody hears stories, you know, but you don't know what's true or what's not because when you get caught, you don't know if somebody snitched or you just got caught. Mm-hmm. So it's like a toss up. But you be hearing names of writers and stuff like that that I don't want to mention their names, but as they said, with snitches. But mm-hmm. I never went writing with any of them anyway. So it didn't really like, like matter to me. But I've got chased a few times. And, I remember more of my chases than the pieces I did. Really? Yes. Really? So what you, the, the chasing always outweighed the piecing? Yeah, because I did a lot of pieces. And, you know, when people ask you where you did this piece and where, where you did that piece, I don't really remember. Mm-hmm. But I only remember where I got chased at. Really? So you've just been Brit- like, it was that station or that yard. It was that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yo, that's that's crazy. That's crazy. I, I I I think of these things so romantically. It's like it couldn't be further from my life. But you know, like I was saying at the top of the show, that there was this just this influx of activity coming from New York in the form of Subway Art and Style Wars and Wild Style. From what I remember, um, in Subway Art, there was a photo of you at Dondi's crib. Correct. Yes. Definitely you. Yeah. So who were the other characters that were in that room? For those of you who checked the Subway Art, go check the Bible. In there, there is a Martha Cooper photo that, that, that clearly has you, Dondi. But who were the other characters that were in there? Well, we had um, Aaron, uh, Greg167, uh, Mr. J. Yeah. Me and Dondi. Yeah, well, that's crazy. But, but when I went there, we didn't know that was going to be like a photo shoot or not like that. That's my first time meeting Dondi. Wow. That was your so first went, time meeting Dondi? Yeah, first time meeting Dondi. Wow. Well, that so, was like towards the time I was getting ready to quit in a couple of years. But when I met him, and then all of a sudden, Martha Cooper was there taking pictures. So, but I mean, like all the graffiti books, you look at the pictures and stuff. Mm-hmm. A lot of those pictures were mine, were my, my pictures. For real? Yeah, because I used to trade with. With um, they had people that take a lot of pictures. So I had to trade some of my pictures for some of the pictures I wanted. That's how I ended up getting. I had like eight books, like four pages on each side. What? But I lost all of them. I I let somebody hold them when I went to Florida. When I came back, he had passed away, and the books were lost. Oh my God! Can you imagine? Uh, Yo, comment below. Uh, Anyone got those books? Get your name on the comments. <laughs> <laughs> or, or we'll have a private conversation between you and me. Yeah? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> never, never. These things should be uh, held in some history museums, bro. That's crazy. So did yeah. you have did you have your own photos in Subway Art and other publications for their time? Well, I had that one. And when I was writing, I didn't see any of these photos. But after I came back in 2010, I started noticing. Some people show me pictures in books mm. and all this of, of my work and all of that. But in my mind, back then you didn't you didn't see it going this far. Mm. You know, it was just something that, that we were just doing. 
I mm-hmm. wasn't thinking about you know how far it would go because I was just just having fun doing what what kids do. For real, what was Dondi uh, like as a character? Well, I, I only met him that one time, really. Mm. Um, you know, he was he was just starting out. He was just starting to get his styles and stuff. You know, mm. but he seemed all right to me. I never had no problem with him. Yeah. You no, know, if I'd have stuck around a little longer, we'd probably get a car together. Well, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I mean. Yeah. You guys were way ahead of that period. Um, right. So would you argue that 70, and I'm just fast tracking slightly, we will be going back and forth because obviously, okay. you know, my timelines are, <laughs> right. they're, 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 they're up and they're transient. Um, uh, 74, 75, would you say was the era of when you did the whole train Christmas? Oh, Christmas no, we special? did that in, in like 77. 77, like, a little later. Yeah, when I first started, like in 75, I was, uh, right with a crew called Top. They were like mostly doing throw ups. So I used to write R O three. Wow. You know, yeah. But I used to write R O three doing you know silver and red, silver and black throw ups. Yeah. You know, two letters trying to get up. But then it, it dawned on me because every time I used to be like like at 149th Street looking at trains, I never remember all those throw ups that go by. I remember the burner pieces. Yeah, yeah. And that's yeah. what I wanted to do. You wanted to build so, on the burner thing. You wanted to go yeah, big. Because you could sit there all day watching throw-ups. But when that one nice, colorful burner comes through, that's what stays in your mind the whole day. Sounds to me like yeah. the, the, the full, you know, full production pieces. And and bear in right. mind, like, we're talking to a New Yorkian. When you say pieces, you mean train pieces. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh. Just stickly trains. All I did was stickly trains. I, I never even tagged. Because I was never a good tagger. All I want to do is put my name on the side on a panel and have a nice style, colorful, and everything. That's 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 where my heart was. God, I love you say that. God, that takes my books. Uh, um, <laughs> so, uh, pad two was pad two before then. Say that again. Was pad two before then your previous? Oh work? no, I, I did pad when I was writing slave. Okay, so one day I, right. I went to layup and I was just tired of doing slaves, so I, I said, let me try some, another name. So I did pad two. So, what, what, okay, right. So let's get this timeline straight, just so I'm clear. So um, I'm, I'm guessing that the reason why you went with the bigger pieces as opposed to the throw-ups and tags is because it was there was an abundance of throw-up and tags and you just didn't get a look in. If the train went past, all you'd be seeing is like pattern, 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 but nothing spectacular that took people's attention. Was Is that what, what we're saying? Yes, yes. That's crazy. When you, when you, Chad, you know, if you sit at rush hour when all, like you put, like rush hour early in the morning, we used to be at 149th in the Grand Concourse. That was like a, a writer's bench where everybody's come there early in the morning on the rush hours to see all the new pieces that were done the night before. So when you just seeing two letters going by, you're not really, you know, you see it, but you're not really paying attention because you see like silver and red coming through. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden you see this spectacular panel with a piece of all kinds of colors and designs and, and style. And so when you leave after that, that's the only thing that will remain in my mind mm. is that one piece, you know, that burner. Mm. How many people were um, at 149th Street at the time? 149th Street, right? Yes, and the concourse. Uh, concourse, yeah. How many, how, many, uh, how many writers, how many people were there to just literally spectate? This is so romantic to me. Were right. people just there just waiting to see what the newness was? Yes, it's, oh, it'd be like 20, 30, 40 people. Be sitting on a bench and on the stairs, everywhere. That's what got the police, you know, kind of wondering why everybody just standing around, sitting around. We were all writers. <laughs> we just watching the train because we was on the on the twos and fives. That was like the most elite line. You know, all the burners and new styles mm-hmm. and everything. So everybody gathered there early in the morning. By the rush hour, like from rush hour, like from seven to nine or something like that. And after that, everybody. This and everybody go racking more paint. How many people, give me some names of who else was, you know, congregating there for its time, give it just off the head. Uh, yeah, you can see uh, Chain 3, TK, um, most of the guys around 
my time, um, just so many, because they had riders from the four line, from the five line, from the two line, then people come there from the from the letter line because they wanted to meet some of the people from the IRT lines. Mm. So every day is like different people just in and out, in and out, in and out. I can't really wow. remember everybody's name because wow. I was I first went there, I was like a toy. I just started too. But then I started getting up. Wow. So like MTA Re part one. Yeah. They, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, they're good friends of mine. We've we go way back from the seventies, the early seventies. I just want to circle back to the uh the uh Christmas train because that was so that was that was a historical moment. Like you guys, that whole that it became it was a subject matter in, you know, tabloid newspaper that this this thing had happened. All right. You know what I mean? Like it really it knocked the shit out of, you know, people's attentions and Fab Five, the crew suddenly became this, you know, this force, didn't it? Yeah, because at the beginning, you know, it was always the idea to do 10 cars, but we was going to take like all the elite writers from the two to the five, and we were going to do the, try to get everybody together to do the 10 cars. But, you know, you can't get everybody together. It never really worked out. So one day I, I went by Lee's house, and Lee and Mona was there. They were was, they was getting ready to leave to go do the whole train. And they included me in since I came there that day. Because we tried, we ended up doing with all, trying to do all the Fat Five together because all the other writers on the line couldn't get, they, some couldn't do it that day, some couldn't do it that day. So we just scrapped that idea. We just, they totally did it with the Fat Five. Incredible. Just spectacular. And the, the, the reverberations of that happening really, I think it really changed the way people um, what's the worst way to explain it? It, it gave an, a fresh kind of uh, way in which publicity would would broadcast such events within graffiti. You know what I mean? Right. It changed the way people were receiving the quote unquote quote, criminal damage aspect of it as a as a negative. But when people were seeing it, all of a sudden it was like, "Yo, well that looks really dope." <laughs> Oh, when when the ten cars came through the station when we first did it, people was in awe. It was all top to bottom, whole cars, characters, everything. The whole the whole ten cars, and you could still smell the paint. It was still fresh. You could still smell it. Oh my god, that's yeah, good. Could, and we inside the train go because we try to get to so take pictures when it came through because when we did it at. It's on the opposite side when they pull into the station, the first station. Because if they would have saw it when it first came in, the train wasn't around. But we did on the, it was on the opposite side against the wall when it came in. So we got to run that day. But it only ran that day. Wow. But when it ran, you, we, you could hear everybody, ah, ooh, oh, my God. It was crazy in the stations. It was it was, it was just so pretentious. pretentious. It was crazy. We did, okay, so just to put that in, into a, a bit more of a storyline, did you jump on the train and when when it was running, were you in it and you'd get out and you'd listen to what people were saying as they, as it was pulling up? You could hear it. We was inside the train, riding with the train because we were trying to ride it to the last time so we could get the pictures. Yeah. Because we knew after that day they would not run together. Mm. But once it, when it pulled out the layup and it, it all stayed together, we we caught it and jumped in the train, and you know back then the train didn't really have a lot of AC, so some of the windows were down when we mm. in the train. And you hear when they're pulling into the stations, niggas, everybody was going crazy when they saw it. That's you talk about regular ordinary people going to work. They they seen all the colors and all the characters, and it was just amazing to them. They loved it. They loved it. They they didn't even care. They couldn't see through the window. They just loved what they were seeing when it pulled in. Oh my god, that is so so sick. Yeah. So so did Lee um Fab Five Lee, did he conceptualize it? Did he was how deep would it within the 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 um background did he get into the calculations on how to do stuff, what was going on, what um car, etc. How how deep did that go in conceptualizing? Well he always from about a year, two a year, two years ago before that. He always pictured it in his mind what it was going to be like. 
So every year, you know, they discussed it. Although he already had a picture in his mind. <laughs> so automatically, the set of car was going to be the Fabulous Fire car. That's the one that had the Mickey Mouse on it. Mm -hmm. That was definitely going to happen. And as, you know, as we painted it, but he already had, everything was in his mind anyway. Was it really on paper? He probably had a few characters on paper, but he already had the vision of what it was going to be like. And him telling us that we all had the vision of what it was going to be like. Once we knew we were going to all do it, the Fabulous Five, we already knew. And what the concepts were, and we just went and did it. And you wouldn't believe we had so much paint to get into this layout. We had and it was suitcases and everything. It was crazy. That was, that was like hundreds of cans. It was like just running down into there with all this paint was was a chore in itself. Yeah, yeah. It just has got me thinking. So, okay, so in total, how many of you were rolling in? Was it just the five of you, six of you? Was there a, someone looking out? What was the breakdown, the, the pattern, and how it how it all came about? The first day when we went out, Leah Mona was going to do it. And Dr. Slug was supposed to come, mm -hmm. but I think they didn't want to come or something. But I happened to come by Lee's house, and I was there. So me, Lee, and Mono went. We went there first. Mm -hmm. We had all this paint. It was just, his, Lee mother made us sandwiches. That's how crazy that was. So what? we run it out with, with yeah, food on. and hold, paint. Hold on, honey. You might be hungry. Here's some sandwiches. Was that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, sandwiches, crackers. It was, it was ridiculous, yo. My mother wouldn't have made shit for us. <laughs> She said, just don't call me if you get caught. That's all she would have said. Yo, I can't get over it. Stop it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we ran down. We did it. We set up everything. We All the cans we were going to use on each car. We went inside of the car and put the paint in the seat because the seats lift up. But we put it in for all the paint for that car. We put it into the seats on each car. Right. So just in case something happened, we won't lose all the paint. It'll be inside of the seats in the car. Mm -hmm. The police never looked there. That's a, that was a very clever. That that's a tactic uh, that was used quite frequently, wasn't it, in those early days? Yes. You don't want to lose all your paint. Mm. So we were doing it. Then um, Doc and Slug came later on that night, and they came in and they had a big flashlight. And they were banging on the trains. They were acting like they were the police. Wow. So we all, me, Mono, and Doc. We thought it was the police, so we had to run out of the, out, out of the layup. And when there was a train coming in, you know, on the regular tracks, uh -huh. so when they chased us out, I had to we had to try to run out of the, out of the tunnel and all that with the train passing by and everything, so we could have got killed. <sighs> but, it was, but it was Doc and Slug playing around. What? Yeah. So we had to go back the next day. I didn't, they didn't get in touch with me the next day. So um, Doc and Slug went the next day, and they went and got all the paint and finished up the rest of the 10 cars. Wow. But as long as the mission was accomplished, it didn't matter to me. Yeah, 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 yeah. But being a part uh, of that is... Wow. Well, curiously, do, do, for its time, was, there a, was it a high-risk factor, like... Nowadays, you've got mad security cameras, trip wires, you know, you got madness. No, this was before the 9 um, 11, so there wasn't no, wasn't no cameras and nothing down there. But but you could always smell the paint. So the police, if they can smell the paint, you know, because it goes up through the vents. Mm -hmm. And when the train goes by, it goes into the station, you can smell the paint. Because that's, that's a huge amount of paint. That's a huge amount of paint. Yeah. What? You, you could see all the paint in the air while we were painting. Because they ain't got lights in the tunnel, so you could still see the mist all over. Yeah. But it was late at night, so, you know, a lot of people don't be riding the trains. And plus, you know, the mist the mist goes in with the train. But you know, we're kind of aware, because we, we turned whole cars before, but we never did a massive 10 cars. Mm. But it was, it was just... I don't know. It might have been the luck of the Irish. But that's what I'd say. Well, we got it done. <laughs> yeah, and the fact that you even to get some photos after as well, because this was. A, I, I, th I guess that it comes to a point where the the the, um, the art that's running is so seismic. You, you, oh. Authorities are kind of got to take their hats off and say, "Okay, listen, we submit. <laughs> you know, we we can't we can't stop running a whole train. <laughs> Just let it go." All right. Let's see. We. Wait until we, when we rode the train 
to the next to the last stop. And we got out. And somebody stayed in. So when the train came back down, because we know it was only going to run that one time that day. Mm. So they went to the last stop and came back. We pulled the emergency brake. So that way, the train is facing us. And that's how we got all the pictures. Damn. See, were you guys the only ones that got the pictures, you think? Yeah, I think so. Wow. I don't even have the pictures. I mean, Lee got all the pictures. I've seen some old school um, newspaper cuttings. I've seen some paper cuttings in the flesh. I've seen like original newspaper cuttings of that. And right. how it, yeah. What was the last two cars? Yeah. With, with what was Doc and Mono. That's the one. That's the one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about for the UK equivocal, I guess we're talking about the the Metro newspaper, which is the, you know, the, the, the newspaper that people get in, right. you know, in the, in the, in the tube stations. It was that level, wasn't it? And, and the New Yorker post and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. It was, uh, I think it was in the village voice. I think. That's the one, the village voice. Right. They had the, like the last two called the Lee Mono and Doc, the, the reindeers and stuff on it. Man. That was the last car. Last two cars. You guys must have been yeah. superstars at that point. This just must have oh, been. Oh, yeah. Really. Well, right, it saw that they were going crazy too. But I heard there was other people that did 10 cars, but I don't think it ran. I was, I know I was ran that day. And we had, took the prison and had proof. So that's yeah. like a, like a something in history with, with a graph. For real. Yeah. Um, and then it spawned other, it spawned other. Um, I guess battle-esque kind of people ready to throw down, you know, re and crew suddenly, you know, they rolled in with the 12 car, they then went and did a 12 car and it became this friendly right. kind of rivalry, right? Well, I don't know, because I quit in the 80s, so Yeah, true. Right, 79, 80 nobody had did 10 cars when I was, when I was right. Mm. After I left, I heard people did uh, 10 and 12 cars. But it's 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 the, to me, it's the bottom line is the original one that ran is the one that, that made history. Mm, big time. Let's go back. So uh, where did you grow up? Whereabouts in New York did you grow up? Oh, I, I grew up in Brooklyn. I was born in the Bronx, but I, I grew up in Brooklyn, first East New York, till I was about 10, then I moved to Crown Heights. And how old, at what era, what, what, what was the year on that? This was like, um, maybe like 69, I moved to, I lived in the Bronx, so I moved to, to Brooklyn when I was like about three or four. So that might have been in the 60s. Yeah. And by like 69, 70, I moved to Crown Heights in Brooklyn, in the other part of Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. And But I wasn't even, I wasn't even thinking about train code. When I first grew up in Brooklyn, I grew up in East New York, and I was right by the by the two, the two yard for the trains. Mm-hmm. But I, I didn't have graffiti on my mind at all. I was just like a little kid. Mm-hmm. If I were right then, I'd have been all. Oh, I'd have been killing them. Yeah, yeah, because you're right by uh, where the action. Yeah. <laughs> oh, right. Um, what was the what was the uh, what was the landscape like as a kid? What, what what was what what was what was New York like? You know, they had gangs and stuff. Around my way, they had um, a gang called the Jolly Stompers, mm-hmm. and they had um, the Ghetto Brothers. But you know, I look back at it now, and it's crazy. But but. At the time, it was like just just a normal day, you know. We just that's how we grew up. Play basketball, play football, play football on the uh, concrete. It didn't matter to us. You know, we play stickball, baseball, everything. Mm-hmm. We were just growing up, you know. We ain't sitting in front of TVs and play video games back then. We was out there having fun. Yeah, yeah. So you didn't really frequent with any of the gang related stuff, or of course, you know, being. New York for its time, there was obviously a lot of crime, but but that that internal gang business was well, never you didn't really fuck with. Well, I, well, I grew up so every school I went to had gangs, mm. you know. So for a little while, I was a ghetto brother. When I was younger, we was like the little ghetto brothers, but it's you know, this is, it's just something you got to do around the way where you live at. Really, you know, so it's like yeah. more of like survival, really. So what were you, as in a little get up brother, you're talking about like you were a prospect, they would, they had like initiative levels in which you'd be, come a, a gang member? Yeah, like you'd have like the ghetto brothers and the younger squad would be the junior ghetto brothers. Mm. You know, they're just like prepping you for, the come to be the, the, the full lady, you know, ghetto brother. But it was, it was just something that we just did around our way, you know? 
You yeah. know, I was, I can't call myself a gangbanger. I call myself a, a hustler, not a gangbanger, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, we just, it's, it's just like, this is part of growing up. It's, I look at it now, it seems stupid, but back then it was just something that you had to do if you wanted to get along. How old were you? Back then, I was about 11, 12, and, and the Ghetto Brothers, the Ghetto Brothers, the Junior Ghetto Brothers. Yo, that's crazy young. Yeah, we had a little uh, vest with the, with the writing on the back, Ghetto Brothers, and with the letters. And one time I had, um, my mother didn't, didn't know about it, and they came home one day, because she used to work at night. Yeah. So when she came home, I, I took the my jacket and put it and threw it in the oven. And but the oven was still hot, so it melted all the letters and everything on on the, on the thing. You could spell it in the house, but she didn't know oh. what it was. Shit. Yeah. So I, mean, I, I got a, I got a lucky on that one. Well, th- from that moment where you just kind of you you, you lived that that gang life. Nah, I wasn't really into the gang life anyway. But, right, right. Well, being down the street making money, and I was more into that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah, I do. I know. I know what you mean because there is, there's a route to passage, and if you if you're from a particular area and that's part of the upbringing and the culture, like you, you've only got one way, and you can actually learn a lot from those early informative years of, like you say, hustling, like trying right. to pattern up and get what you need to get done done, right? Right. You know, anybody used to show. Like then the sneakers, sneaker games start coming out. Everybody wearing Pumas, Adidas, and all that. You know, we kids, so we had to figure out a way to get the money to get them. Or either we go to the store and run out with them. Either mm. way, we, we was gonna get them. You know. Mm. Yeah, but yeah. Back then, you know, when we were kids, we were wearing Converse's and Pro Cares. But after a while, you know, Pumas and Adidas came out, and that's what it was. We had to have them. Really? What? So you used to jack people for their pumas, or it was just a it was just a hustle no. to make the money to buy them. It's just a hustle to make the money, or or be a lot of us going to a store. We just snatch the, the boxes off the shelves and run out. And when we get to where we get to, we just might like exchange sizes. If I don't wear five, if I snatch size eight, nine, I might I switch them with somebody else because I wear eleven or twelve. So we switch them like that. So raising and racking was an early sport. That was that was oh, a, yeah. really yes. Yeah, we didn't pay for anything. Yeah, and we don't end- end- our money. By the way, we don't endorse that on this on this show. You know, it's a right, dangerous boy. sport. You get yourself in trouble. <laughs> right. For real. Um, what was the music of the day for you? You know, because when I think of like my Adidas, you know, the all the obvious, you know, um, comparables like Run DMC play in my mind, but there was a lot of other things going in New York at the time, right? Yeah, well, you know, see, that's what that one used to get me with their questions. They just say uh, that um, that graffiti wasn't was an element of hip hop, but they when you put it, did you when you want to put the facts on the papers? We used to listen to, they used to cut, bring the turntable to the parks, find regular records with with little break beats, and they used to mix them back and forth. And somebody get on the mic, we used to do it in the past before the records. Mm. So, but a lot of people that say it wasn't part of hip hop was, was people that didn't listen to it, wasn't living our life. You know, mm. everybody, I ain't gonna say, I just say a lot of white people used to listen to hard rock and all that. Mm. And they talking about, and they don't, well, how can they speak on hip hop they know nothing about? Yeah, 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 yeah. This is what we grew up on. We used to go to the parks, people come with the two turntables and speakers. I plug it into the, the lampposts in the parks on the street parties and all that, and, that, and they'd be cutting the records. And that was before I wouldn't even name hip hop, you know. And somebody get on the mic with a little bit of rhymes, and you know, that's 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 what I remember. Mm. Jams in the park. Mm. But they try people tell me all this other story, but you can't dispute of what I live. Mm. So I try to explain it to them, but they don't want to hear it. They they going by what some people said this, some people said that. I lived a life. And you so, saw yeah. hip hop as hand in hand with graffiti. Yeah, yeah because a lot of a lot of people that used to DJ and all that in the parks mm. were writers. They were writers mm. too. Yeah, I noticed that. So a lot of DJs were writers. I noticed yeah. that shit a lot, bro. Yeah. 
So how can you not include that in hip hop? That's what I'm saying. Thousand percent. I I know so many DJs and producers that are also writers. It's yes. uncanny. All right. And you're right. I I guess for the I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't want to stereotype anybody, but for scene, for instance, who who Thanks widely that. says, "Yo, I I listen to Black Sabbath and Dick X Y and Z," but yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. He's one of the main ones that said it. Yeah. And somebody quoted me of what he said. I said, well, how, "How can he tell you our life story? He has nothing to do with our lifestyle." So because he he, he made it famous now doesn't mean he. He lived that life. He didn't live that life. Mm. So, so you're, you're saying it's a misconception from the opposite side that actually hip hop was so ingrained in the culture of its time. It moved hand in hand because it was the the audience and they were participators in graffiti. Yeah, because when again late at night, people bring out these the, the amps and, and turntables and all that into the park. Hmm. There was no white guys down there with us. Hmm. It was mostly black and Puerto Rican. So how can a white guy speak on this aspect of our life hmm. when you hmm. never lived it? Hmm. I don't know what y'all do. Y'all listen to your hard rock? Cool. Yeah. But don't 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 try to, you know, tell us exactly what is it is not hip hop when you never lived a hip hop life. That's interesting you've said that. That's really thrown the I think for a lot of there's there's clearly like a misconception. I think also, right. I think also graffiti did have more of a, um, I guess it, it, it was only natural that it, dis, it, it disconnected slightly from the, the origin in the same way DJing did when the technology, technology advanced and right. it wasn't so much about cutting up the brakes. Right. I, I guess this is just a natural progression, right? Yeah, because, you know, sometimes, you know, that's one thing, people, if if you know records and, and you know, you were jazz records, rock records, mm. but the DJs used to hear that one, you know, kind of beat and just cut it back and forth to make it a whole completely different record. Yeah. So now when you're at the jazz, you, they start playing it, they start cutting it up. It sounds like a complete record, but it's just little break parts that they put together. And they scratch it with the beat and all that. It's just like a whole different ball game, you know. And and we out there, we vibing on this because that's that's what we know. And and even though it was illegal, plugging it into the uh, to the light post and all that, but it didn't stop us. That's what we did. <laughs> yeah, that's so incredible. I mean, like, listen yeah. to to some of the, it's gonna be some young people that are watching, and and I'm one of them, man. Like, I wasn't there in any in any way spectating even on tv or i was young but for real for real like hip-hop spawned things like the remixes spawned things like b-boying which turned into right. con- turned into a contemporary olympic sport right it, shit just doesn't happen out of thin air the buck stops in these places and it's unconceivable in 2022 that there was even a beginning it's like it it feels so it feels such a stretch to so to hear you say this is a complete and utter breath of fresh air you know right because even um when Fat Fire Freddy got the idea and he went to MTV they made yo raps mm. see that that was a, a big thing because now it's on TV how was your how, what was your opinion with because uh, I, I know New Yorkians so far as Fab Five's Freddy's concerned um, he 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 can sometimes be uh, almost a bit of a hipster of his time, and it, it, that doesn't always sit well with the more hardcore. But you guys actually were the Fab Five. How did you feel about him taking Fab Five and making Fab Five Freddy? Well, um, he 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 first met Lee, and then I I met him through Lee. Right. And not that he was a Fab Five, but he. He did help us get, you know, little jobs here and there doing um, storefronts and all of that. But graffiti, and plus he had a, the gift of gab to talk. So he got us into a lot of different things that, that we didn't really know about. So I give him props for that because we went to a, um, a, a um, Blondie had a, a party when she was, when she was kind of fresh on the scene and she had a, a party in the loft. We wasn't used to nothing like that. You know? Wow. But it, 
it was like it was amazing to us. Mm. No, Blondie was like the pinup girl of the time, right? New York, yeah. And, and she the one that made that record. And they said Fat Five Freddy, and ever since then, that's how I know him as Fat Five Freddy. But why was he okay? So is is there a reason why? First of all, my first question is: Is there a reason why? Was that an accident that he ended up being called Fab Five Freddy based on what Blondie said, or was this something that was put into the the, the you know the um, the Ephra via oh. Fab Five the crew? See, I don't know how he got the name. All I know, he's supposed to be with Lee. You know, he's he lived around my way in Brooklyn, so he's come by my house sometimes. But you know, I guess being with Lee as a Fabulous Five, and and they had. They, he had somehow got them a show to do in Italy and stuff. So I just being around Lee so much. I don't know where the Fat Five Freddy came from. I don't know if he originated it or Blondie originated it. Mm. But the first time I heard it was in the Blondie record. That must have blown so, your mind. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> that, <laughs> that, <laughs> yes, it did. <laughs> you know, I don't want to say that on that one, but it, it, it threw me for a loop because I know he wasn't no Fab Five at the time. Yeah. So uh, I, I heard it in the record, Fab Five Freddy, and I was like, what? He ain't in Fab Five? What the fuck? Yeah, not that I know of. And, you know, I was, well... Did that you know, make you want to put a team money. meeting or something? Did that make you want to be like, yo, hold on, what's this? Well, I, I was the last number inducted into the Family Five, so I didn't really have no say-so, so I, I you know, I, there's nothing I could do about it. Because around that time, I was quitting anyway, but see, originally, the Fab Five came from um, the writers in, like, 72, 73. It was Mono, Doc, Slug, Professor 2, and OG 2. Mm. They, they was originally um, part of the Fantastic Partners. Yes. At TFP. Yeah. And they branched off from TFP and made the Fabulous Five. Wow. Okay. So... And then after that, Mono and Doc and Slug had quit, but then they came back and 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 they met Lee and then they started the Family Five over. And then one day, um, excuse me, one day they saw me at Brooklyn Bridge watching the trains and they asked me who I what I write. And I said slave, and then they inducted me into the Family Five. So that's how the Family Five got to meet me, Lee, Mono, Doc, and Slug. We the one that put out the most of the work. At, wow. at that time, yeah, 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 and this is how the, and this kind of from where I, from my standpoint, obviously being younger, like Fab Five were that 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 to me was the kind of the starting lineup. So to right, speak, do you know what I mean? And that's why I was curious about Fab Five Freddy and how that kind of came about. But like you say, I guess it was like the later stages of you being even you even doing graph, right? Right. Well. well. He never went with us to, to no layup to do no pieces, so no, I can't. He might have, I don't know what he did with Lee. I don't know. I I don't, yeah. prefer, if, if you're not doing the paintings, then you ain't no five five. You got to get in there and put in the work. Well, yeah, he at least be in no work when I was there. Yeah, yeah. so how strange. So. What a curious, what a curious case. Well, I'm sure we'll more be, be revealed as well, podcasts go on. Um, right. Is it there's a there's an older uh, urban myth that. Zorro in Wild Style was originally meant for Dondi. Is that correct? And then Lee took the role. See, I see. I wasn't here that time, so I can't speak on that one. Because yeah. after I, after I, I, I got a car in like the eighties, I never mm. even looked back on graffiti. Period. I didn't even look at no trains. I didn't even drive no trains. I, I drive my car. How many trains do you reckon you've done over your period? Over the period of uh, of you being active? How many trains? Oh, I don't even know. Even to today, people might send me a picture that I don't remember doing. Really? So I can't I can't even put an account on it. Really? I can't yeah, I have no idea. Cause I just I was just painting. You know, get paint and go writing. Every day. Huh? Not every day, but at least once or twice a week. Really? Maybe more. How is it, it, how, how how regular were you able to obtain the paint? Like, was that was the interim times the time for you to collect all your all your your paint, and then to the point you were ready? Was it just a, a speed thing? Would you have done more? 
Well, you know, doing the burners take a little bit of time, so mm. I, I might do like one when I go. I can't do like two, three, or four. I ain't got that much time in the layup. Mm. So I'm not even getting ready to go to jail for not for writing my name, but mm. you know, we see, I used to wrap paint a lot, so I have staff in my house. So when I get the opportunity to go, I go. Mm. I have paint. I never really went to no no place and pick certain colors. I just Rack paint, rack paint, rack paint. Mm. And later on, I just look at what I got and then I put it together and go and do something. That's a real, that's a real, um, a real true attitude, I think. And I think that's a measure yeah. on the era. You know, you, you rack till you collect a substantial amount and then right. you're able to make the burn. Like it doesn't work the other way. You don't find specific colors, do you? No, we just go and throw them in our coats, throw them in our waistband, throw them in the arms of our coats. Mm. But one thing for sure, Lee always had paint. He had a, a not like a man's dresser. Mm. You have in your room. Mm. He had all the drawers full of paint. Always, really, always. I never seen it empty yet. Wow. What's so what are you talking like? Three or four hundred cans at, like... at a time. <gasps> always, always. That's why. He, see how many cars he did. Mm. He, he would do a double cars. That's how much pain he had. Yeah, he was. Pro- he listen, guys. And if you, you know, we're talking age demographics here. Like Lee was, he was like a bit of a golden child, right? He just yes. he, he was he conceptualized shit like really to the to the wire, right? Yes, and he's he's that fast painting that he could paint two, as I paint one. Mm. You see, and and he can climb the trains and hang out the wind, hang up. If we be at a layup that's not on a platform, he can climb the train, hold on to the window, and spray this side, and then move to the next window, put that one up, put this one down, and go along the car painting. He can be on on elevated train lines. He can do whole cars. (sighs) See, me myself, I can't even go on the elevated line because I don't like heights. Yeah, you're not the it. first person to say that. A few people have said that. Like, yeah, yeah like I spoke with Ree and I, you know, he it wasn't for the faint hearted. You know, part one was the same. Right. It's, um, it, I mean, dude, like, we, you know, we don't have that measure of height on our trains. New York is notorious for that. Like, right. And, and like the walkways on those, on the elevated lines, they were wood and they've been mm. out there for years. So they're rotten. Mm. When you're walking on it, it's bending in and out. It's cracking. And, and you got this one little handrail, like a pipe, to hold on to. You, it, it wasn't for me. Because no. if the police come, how am, I, how am I supposed to get away? They talk about you go through the, the parts in the tracks and go down the, 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 the pole that holds the train up. That, that's the last thing on my mind, trying to squeeze between <laughs> this. Go down, not me. I, I, already can't, I already can't look down, so you know, I don't, there's no sense in me going. Yeah, yeah, I, ain't, I'm not about that life. Yeah, no, not at all. <laughs> I, I tried one time. I got like ten feet out, and I turned around and came right back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was it like? Yeah. Some vertigo shit? You were just like, no, 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 no. No, uh, and I'm walking. It just go like you want to crack. I, no. I, I said, no, that's as far as I go because the police come. I can't get away. Period. Yeah, I'll yeah. be frozen. I'll be frozen on a train come. I might get hit by a train. Can't do the heights. Thousand percent. And and I might just add again, do not try this shit at home. Even in this day and age, there is a lot of obstacles and things that right. fucking kill you. Don't get involved. Don't do no. it. There's right. your claws, you've been warned. Um fam, that is mad. Yeah, I mean, because the more that the wood is creaking, if I was anybody that was I would just be thinking to myself, well, if I'm doing it and there's hundreds of writers out there right now, they All must right. be doing it. Like this wood is just not built for everybody. Yeah, well, they, they changed it now, so it's not wood anymore. I don't know if it's metal or, or hard plastic. I don't know because I, I don't even indulge in that. But what, what they have now is, is, is stable, yeah. but you can walk on. Because they had two guys, I, I think they came from France or somewhere, they, they yeah. just got killed yeah, uh, right. last year, I think. Rest in peace. Because, yeah, because yeah, you, can't, you can't go to these some layups without knowing, you know, you have to have somebody that's with you that knows can't mm-hmm. just go because mm-hmm. where they went to it wasn't no you got like like you got red and, and white stripes on the mm-hmm. side I mean there's no clearance 
Wow. And and they try to get in from from the station, the elevated station that goes down into the tunnel. So I guess they try to walk from there down into the tunnel, but that's not how you get in that layer. Oh my so they God. didn't know, I guess. And they got caught with the train either coming in or came out coming out, but it, nobody could they didn't find their body hours later because it, the trains dragged them all the way to the to the, the elevated station. And nobody really noticed their body. Didn't so even know that. Tunnel, tell how many times they got ran over by a train. Yeah, that must have been repeated. They just would have just been Yeah, because it was it was late. It was like early morning. So you don't know how many trains done hit them because all they found were parts. Oh my so, goodness, that is terrible. That's why people like just come here, you just don't jump out there unless you with somebody that, that, that knows these layups. What used to be the layup time? What used to be the turnaround time of trains in the layups? Like, like did you have a timer? Did, was it to the to the wire back then? I'm sure it is now. Well, they had daytime layups where, um, you know, rush hour was like from nine to, I mean, not nine, like maybe seven to, to nine, nine thirty. Mm. And then some layups, you know, the day layups. They lay they lay those trains up on a, on the express tracks. Mm. They just the local trains run at non rush hours. Yeah. Then like from like two thirty three o'clock, then they'll pull those trains back out into service to run express. And that's that's that daytime left. And at nighttime, they have um it's the the express times are like from maybe three to six seven, and then they start laying them up at night. Mm. When they lay them up at night, it's overnight. So they had layoffs. They, they put them in the yards, or they put them in certain layoffs. They sit there overnight. Mm. So that's when you, you go in at night, and, and you do what you got to do. You know? What was your favorite then, layup? What was your favorite layup of its time? That time was Utica because I live three blocks from Utica. Wow! So I used to go there, but I, I painted everywhere. I painted. I painted. I did a lot more in the Bronx than I did in Brooklyn. I lived in Brooklyn. Yeah, but that would make sense. That makes sense, wouldn't yeah. it? Yeah, because in the Bronx, there's more layups on yeah. on IRTs or two, three, four, and five. Yeah. In Brooklyn, <clears throat> there's like two. Either the yard or you hit Utica or you might get hit Kingston in the daytime. Mm. <clears throat> but in, in the Bronx, they had, <clears throat> they had um, all different layups all over the Bronx. Layups, yards, everything. So. Yeah. More opportunities in the Bronx. Than twos Brooklyn. and fours, twos and fives. Right. Three. Yeah. Everything. One. <clears throat> everything was in the Bronx. So I'm at. Give me one of your craziest one, because I know you probably have many. <laughs> You're more than <laughs> welcome to indulge. But uh, um, <clears throat> give, us some, give, us some, give us some legendary, give us some legendary graph stories, something that, you know, some yard classics. Give us give us something right. that can give us a, a gauge of, you know, the, the activity. All right. Um, when I first met Mono, it was at Baychester Layup. So all of us had a lot of rides. We went racking that whole day, racking paint. Mm -hmm. So the Baychester Layup is, is two trains laid up, but, you know, laid up for the night. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know... Usually you go at night, but for some reason, I don't ask you. We went when it was just getting dark. <clears throat> so we was we we went, it's between the stations. So we went down. It's 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 a little high, but it's not elevated because it's on solid ground, but it's just you know a little raised. Mm. So so we go between the two cars. Yeah, the train here and the train there. So we ended up getting ready to paint. But, so it's like a corridor. It was like one there, one right, on the side, and you right. yeah, got you. But but the Vandal Squad had this had that layup set up. So when we all got there to start painting, all of a sudden the, the lights came on and the doors opened. <gasps> so not as every man for themselves. Yeah. So when when they opened, you know, everybody, you know, they don't know what to do. They're just running. But I went under the train. To the other side and ran down the little hill. Mono, he went on top of the train and he ran all the way to the end. And then he looked, you know, from jumping from the train down, it was a little steep. So instead of him running to jump down, he jumped into the trees that was on the side and grabbed onto the trees and he had got away. What? 
Yeah. So for he you. Did. It was crazy, but you had to do what you had to do. But on some Tarzan shit. <laughs> yeah. That was like on I think it was a Friday we went. But on Monday morning, like I had on a red scully cap. Mm-hmm. So Monday morning I, I went to go see who did the pieces at 149th Street. And the Vandal squad, these two um cops named Hickey and Ski, they came down and tried to pick me up for being there that night. But if you can't if you ain't catch me that night, I don't care if you take me down to the police and do all that. Yeah, if you didn't catch me doing it, you can't say I was there because I have on a red hat. Mm. So that didn't work out for them at all. Mm. But I don't know who got caught that night. But I, I know it wasn't me. And I know it wasn't Moto. So. That's all the matters. <laughs> yeah. Then, then another time we were painting on um, in Unica in the daytime. Mm. It was me, part of all of us, a lot of us, a few of us. So. When you go to Utica, you you wait for the train to like come from the outside station into the tunnel. Mm. So when it goes down, we climb up through the park to get on the tracks, and then we run behind that train that's going down. Then there's a layup right there. Mm. So we went in there and we started painting, and that was in the daytime. And they like kind of a big street called Eastern Parkway. They got mm-hmm. the the grates in the in the in the street. Mm. So. Uh, I guess some guys that stole a, a purse from an old lady or something, and the cops was up there, and and somebody was yelling. They went down in there. They went down to the grates in the tunnel. So when they said that, part heard them, and, and we all had to get away from there because they mm-hmm. thought we the ones that stole the purse. Mm-hmm. So when we got out on Eastern Parkway, I was the only one from Brooklyn. Everybody else wasn't from Brooklyn. So when they when they came out. Instead of them running with me, they all ran together. So damn. Well, I'm not gonna say stop, run with me. I ran yeah, the other yeah, way. Yeah. yeah, so I ran across Eastern Parkway because they stopped all the traffic. And I ran through the park, hopped over the fences without even touching them. I just leaped over them. And I got away. I don't know what happened with anybody else. Yeah, well, that's a huge schoolboy error on their part. Always go yeah. with the local. <laughs> yeah, they they are all panicked. They all running together. That's easy for them to catch. You probably split up or something. You kind of stand in there going, are they serious? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> they ain't waste no time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Streetwise, I think, um, I mean, and again, we're just going back to an era of a golden, golden era. And there was no technology. There was no phone calls. There was no special cameras. There was nothing. It's like you literally had to rely on your street credibility. You t- had to know yourself, know the streets, know how to walk it. Know how to talk, right, to them, right? Right. That was part of the. That was part of the uh, DNA of a graffiti writer at that time, correct? Yeah, because I met more people doing graffiti than I met hanging out with people. Because yeah. I, I, I lived in Brooklyn. I, I hung out in the Bronx. I heard, hung out in in Manhattan. I hung out in, like everywhere because it wasn't no. It wasn't even about. With no racism, no matter because we're all writers, so we mm. deal with colors that all day long with the paint. So hanging out with each other was nothing. No, oh, that's so and good. I met so many people. You know, I'm if you're from Queens, the Bronx, Manhattan, Staten Island, and everybody that you meet, they got stores that we rack paint in. So we all, you know, it's like a camaraderie. We just all all together. It wasn't, mm. and I met so many people in all. That's the best times of my life, to tell you the truth. Really. Yeah. So when you when you got 10, 20 people together, you feel invincible. You do all kind of dumb shit. But we did we just did it though. Dumbest shit. Yeah. Give me some of the dumbest shit. Tell me, tell me some of the dumbest oh. shit that happened. We never pay for anything. Mm. We have a bag full of paint, racking all day. And still hot the turnstile. Mm. That's how dumb that was. We really got caught. We got caught with all the paint. Yeah, that's dumb. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, we had so much pain that just turns out anyway. Really? Well, bags we never paid for anything. Really? We go to stores, rap, we used to steal beer. We used to steal um, this, this coffee called Bustello because the inspiring people like Bustello. So we steal it and sell it on the streets. We go to stores and um, we used to rack bacon, eggs, and all that. But we once I racked bacon, eggs, we went to Tracy House, he hooked up the breakfast, then we went racking. Tracy. <gasps> Tracy 168. There's another uh, fucking legend, man. Yeah. Wow. 
What was what was like? What was it like being around characters like that? That's that's something else. Because oh, they want that. They want to really teach you the ropes. That's how we learn. Did they teach you the the, the uh, devil in the details? They still teach you how to get into layoffs. Teach you how to get away. You know, have your minds set for whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Mm. So you really know how to react to what's going to happen. Mm. So I never went painting with Tracy. I went racking with Tracy. Yeah. Was uh, like as a character. Yeah, oh yeah. He's, he's still a character. He ain't changed. Really? It was amazing. Um, his writer called FDT 56. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, now I met him. He, he, used to, he used to kill everything with tags all over. And I met him when I first started. And then when I met him like 20, 30 years later, he still remember who I was. And I was a toy then. He got this fantastic memory. He remembers everything. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah. That's make that makes for a good podcast. And yeah, you gotta get FTT on. Bro, like that's definitely one person you definitely need to get because he don't he can tell you stories on stories on stories. He got a photographic memory. Yeah. I, I get the feeling that I get the feeling with, with New York is although the stories are vast and actually they they they, they it does collage together in some ways a lot of it is because the, the new york scene although you know there was there's always friction and tension for its time that that there was a lot of camaraderie and a lot right. of like you're saying like tracy you'd just be racking with him but you wouldn't go painting but there's always a story right. within a story right right because I, I never had a chance to go painting with him mm. we just rack you know but it'd be, it'd be like 20 of us go racking you know then everybody just decides they're gonna paint that night or not. You know, it's you just you just have to paint to paint mm. when you want to. That's mm. what the thing was. There were no planting or going with anybody painting and stuff because when you get with too many people, shit happens. Yeah. You can't you be in a tunnel painting one or two people, it's cool. Five or six, seven people, paint goes everywhere. You know, they can smell it at the station. Mm. So you don't want to have too many people because when shit happens, you want to know how to get away. You can't be bumping into everybody, bumping into each other, and everybody panicking and stuff. You got you know, you to go a real rise and know how to get away. Pack of wolves, isn't it? It's almost like it's, yeah. everyone scatters, and it's like, well, what are we doing? It's like, yeah. yeah. That makes it harder to get away when everybody scatters all different ways and don't know what they're doing, you know? You'll run this way, then they turn around, run this way. Run. Now, you confusing everybody else because we are running a certain way to a certain exit and getting out. You running back and forth, and you know, like your head is cut off. You know, it's, it's you don't want to leave a man behind, but you're gonna leave the man behind. It's bound to happen, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, Lee Monodoc, slave, slug. Like you guys were almost like the first prototype of, um, in my mind, anyway. In this conversation, I think it highlights it even more an organization, almost like. A, a level of elitist. I know there were others for its time, but these names, you, they, they, they're, they, they, they're, they're like they're these mystic folk kind of, you know, like the predecessor, the, the, the beginnings of, do you know what I mean? The, this orchestrated fashion of productions and the values within them, you know what I mean? Yeah, see, when we all wrote together, Fab Five, when we write together, we know what moves to make, you know? We're not worried about getting caught. Because mm-hmm. we're gonna get away because we like think alike, you know. We know whatever land, whatever land we go to, we know what to do in case something happens here, something happens there. We know what to do. It's like an unspoken word. Somebody come from this way, we know to go that way, and we know where to jump out the exits, to run down the track. It just it's just instinct mm-hmm. that we all you know because we all vibe together for so long, so we know how to get away. But Big no. up Duster, of course. Big up Duster, who connected oh, us. Oh, yeah. Well. 100. Definitely. Another OG. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Duster, I love you, bro. Give me this opportunity. Yeah, for real. You're the man, though. Yeah, for real, for real. Um, and as a just to slightly tilt the, uh, the uh, timeline a little bit, and uh, actually, as a, a bit of a surprise to me was the... Departure from graph into hot rods and, you know, sp- speed racing like motor car. Act- you were your 
you're banging into that, and that's what sent you from um, New York to Florida, correct? No, see, I went to Florida to get away from a lot of stuff. So okay, but when I went down there, to tell you the honest truth, I didn't know too much about cars. Really? But down there, down there, it's it's like a, you know, I be in New York, so when you go to the Florida, you kind of meet like-minded people that that's hustle and do, you know, you just vibe with certain people. Then a lot of them dudes that I met was in the racing. And when I had my car, you know, I was, I was too cheap to, to take it to a mechanic, so I bought books. Mm. And I learned how to work on cars. And then I met the guys that were racing cars. And they taught me this and taught me that and taught me that. Before I know it, I was hooked. It was like that's a drug amazing. to me. I couldn't stop. Really? Yeah, I couldn't stop. So did you have I'm a bunch there. of cars? Did you have a bunch of cars or this was an, no, more of an occupation? I just had, I had two cars, the kind of race cars, you know, street, street race cars. It was like running 12 seconds, 11 seconds. What? But it was, yeah, in a quarter mile. So, But that's nothing down there. They'd be running nines, eights on the street hard. Really? Yeah. And they, they, they went out of, lot of drug dealers and all that got, got race cars and they got people they pay to drive them. They put a lot of money, really? thousands, ten thousands on a fucking race. So, were you more like mechanically minded? Would you be assisting like the build of of particular cars, cars and stuff? Yeah, mostly like motors. Motors yeah. I was building and building my own motors. Yeah, you know, as as you learn, you you learn more and more. Believe me, I do. I I built two that blew up on me. Really? Yeah, they blew up five even race. <laughs> but you learn as you go. Yo, learn the hard way, bro. <laughs> yeah, it was a oh, hard way, expensive way too. <laughs> yeah, there must have been a lot of because, like you say, uh, for its time, eighties drug dealers, fucking Florida. Right. I mean, you know, this is some there's some classic yeah. films out there that depict that sort of shit. They still doing it. They still now. It's, now it's, it's more all over now. Yeah. Everywhere, North Carolina, South Carolina, everywhere, everybody's street racing now. That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, because you you make more money on the street. Then at the track, you know. Yeah. At the track, you gotta have certain things on your car, you know, to certify your car for to run how fast you run. Well, on the street, you know, nobody knows how fast your car runs. You're not running on with the clocks that show your time at the end of the race. So nobody really knows how fast you're running. Wow. So what you check the clock at the end. Is that what it is? Yeah, when when you're on the track, they got on each side of the draft strip, got Mm. the clock that lights up. that's of how fast you're going and how many miles per hour. Oh, my God. That's good. Yeah. But on the street, everybody go like on a testing tool and like try the car and, and you know, they run it down the track but tell them not to put the time on the board. So, but they know, they give them the slip to show them how fast they're running. So then they come on the street and race. Lee got a race car. Yeah, no, I was going to say, because Lee was also into this too, right? Yeah, yeah. Lee sounds like the kind of character. He's just an adrenaline junkie, ain't he? Yeah, he's a good guy. He's, he's yeah, all the way to the heart. He's he's really a good guy. Yeah, yeah. I did not have any. I mean, you don't get far in this world without that. Like, he's clearly like good stock. Because my nephew caught me one time from New York when I was in Florida. He said, "He said, you know, Lee riding his bicycle down to Florida." What? I I like what Lee. <laughs> He said, Lee, Lee, you're Lee. I couldn't believe it. And it, wow. it was true. And it'll be true. I found out. And I and he when he came down there, man, he went to the draft strip down in Florida. I, but when I think back how Lee is, he would be somebody that would try yeah. something like that, ride a bicycle from New York to Florida. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. He, he's done so well in his career, man, and yeah. still still flourishing. Yes. Yeah, he's still doing what he does. Um do you ever do you have any regrets like with graffiti? Like, do you ever have these kind of I don't know, it, it, you know, age wisdom? Do you ever think back and say, "I oh, kind of wish I hadn't done that," or "I wish I'd carried on"? <laughs> I don't regret anything in my graph life. Nothing. Good man. Good the man. Best time of my life. Yeah. But bet. you know what? The most misconception that people have is is why me as a black man chose the name slave. Ooh. Always come up in the conversation. Always. Yeah, well, I didn't even think about that. That's mad. Go no. on, explain this. 
but it was is that um, I worked in this store called McCory's downtown Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. They had me doing so much shit for a little bit of pay. In my mind, I'm saying, damn, they working me like a slave. <laughs> then I said, oh, shit, let me try these letters. And I tried the letters because not, not a lot of people had their name starting with an S. So that's what made me start you know, doing it on paper. Mm. And before I know it, I liked the name and I, and I started writing Slave. It must be smooth to tag as well. Nice and smooth. Yeah, but the only thing is, I'm not a tagger. I can't yeah. tag with shit. It's mad. Yeah, you don't, yeah you, don't, you don't see no, no tags of Slave on no trains. No, you All don't. you see is the masterpieces. That's it. And in a way, that kind of suits the era fine, right? That you don't you know, no, well, paint. Right. Because to me, I'm not going to go to a train yard and go on the inside of the train writing my name. I want mm. my name on the outside where everybody see. Not going to the inside, take a marker and write slave. I'm not going to the yard to do that. Mm. Because if you get caught, you're getting the same discipline as, as if you're writing on the outside. So I don't want to go on the inside and do something that's this small when I can do something this big. Mm. That's my mentality back then. Any any notable or rather unsung pieces that you've done that you want to flag and say, yo, that was the shit. That's one of my favorite pieces that you've done. Anything out there right now that you know is documented in uh, somewhere in the uh, internet world? Well, uh, let me see. <coughs> all, the, all the slave and leave window down burners that we did. Hard. They're yes. out there. Yeah. Because Lee didn't do too many window downs. He mm. did them with me and he did one with, I think, he did something with the Fabric Five, Five, but me and him used to do a couple of them together. Mm. And then he did, he did one with Billy 167. That was a nice car. But most of those, most of the window down burners I like, you know, then, you know, top to bottom whole, my top to bottom whole car I like the best was have one with Yosemite Sam with the two guns. Oh, yeah, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I liked that one. Yo, sure. yeah. And then I did that. Uh, slave is back because I, I quit at 16 because they were saying if you get caught you go to jail as, as a as an adult adult yeah that's right yeah but then after a while I just said fuck it I came back and started writing again it's so an addiction I did that slave is back shit's an addiction right yeah yeah because when you when you stop when you're right in the, in the middle of of getting big then you stop you miss it you miss it because now you don't know what to do to occupy your time Mm. So rather than do shit that for me to go to jail, I went back to write. Mm. Wow. Oh. Crazy, bro. Crazy. Uh-huh. You were there from the beginning, pretty much. You saw it all. You saw the you saw the OG originals and you took the you were part of the generation that took it to that next phase. All right, cool. Well, because they had common cliff. Mm-hmm. Yes. AJ and staff and all that were right before me. But they're mostly like doing like bubble letters. Some of them had yeah. some style, like like Rips and Pell and all those. They had they had style, you know. You know, a lot of people did the same, same style pieces all the time. Mm. Cause they were just getting up, you know. But then you got those certain people like like Riff, Palo, most most of the TFP writers, Case, Bot. They were doing, you know, things with style letters. Mm-hmm. And then like when they started fading out, that's when I my 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 group of writers came. Mm-hmm. So, so 75 going into 80, and that's when we took their foundation and we reworked it. And then we just doing all kinds of styles. And then as we doing styles, we innovating stuff, then the next man want to innovate something else, and the trains were beautiful. Mm-hmm. Oh, it had so many letter styles in crazy yeah do you think do you you think that the style element like you say that the diverseness of of i guess i guess it comes with every new bergening genre right where you've got so much so much creative freedom there's obviously going to be a vast diversity to begin with but with graph that that should always be the case it shouldn't it, it shouldn't stay in one place it should always grow and always expand and always develop shouldn't it yes yes definitely because we want to see the same thing all the time mm. you want to break out you know because even back in the days they did burners with no 3d 
And then um, in my era, the death squad with Cool and Cool 131 partner on it, they did cars with like pink colors with white outlines and a, and a black cloud with no 3D. Wow. Wow. And the first time I seen it, it reminded me of the old days. And this shit was fire. It was wow. nice. Yo, that's sick. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't always have to be sticking to the rules, does it? No, it's, it's breaking the rules that that got us where we were going in from seventy five to eighty. Everybody was doing everything. Mm, beautiful. Yeah, it was, if you'd seen the lines at that time, burners was all going over the throw ups mm. and covering the cars, and it just made it was really beautiful lines to watch. The twos and the fives and the fours. No like or compare to them back in those days. Yeah, yeah. No, this is the, the message I've got. Um, right. What was the general consensus from the public? Because um, obviously, you know, there, there's always a there's always a flip side to the coin. There's always the opposition. But it right. seems to me like because it was such an, a, a bit of a kind of new school phenomenon that trains were being painted to that level, was there, was there a more kind of pro rather than against from the Joe, Joe public? See, what I think is that was the problem is that when you're when you when you painting the, the whole cars and stuff is that you go over the, you go over the windows and then mm-hmm. you're going over the numbers on the train. See, that was the biggest problem with, I think, the MTA because now you got to clean all the windows and you always got to clean the, the numbers. Mm-hmm. So I think if we'd have been writing and didn't cover those numbers and didn't go over the windows... I don't think they would have really had a, a big problem like they like they had. Mm-hmm. So I think that was they they really problem. Then people all on the inside and writing all over everybody writing over each other, just like be a complete mess. And one time I had pieces doing people doing throw up pieces inside inside the train. That's wow. when it got out of hand, you know. Yeah. That's, that's too a much. Lot. Yeah. Because if you go over the window, that that's extra work for them. Mm. Over the numbers, that extra work for them, but you can't do a whole car without covering the windows. So it's, it's like, which way do you go? Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. And the whole idea, graph, is that it's there's a there's a spiritual freedom to it. There's a the anarchic yeah. kind of right. Yeah. So you really can't control that, really, can you? No, no. Because because once once we once the fat five start doing whole cars, everybody want to do whole cars. Now we're covering yeah. the whole train. Yeah, Top yeah, yeah. to bottom, so it became an epidemic, you know. <laughs> Everybody went out to everybody, you know. They yeah. had um Blade a comment on, on the Bronx. Yep. Family Five over here. Yeah. TMT and TDS doing yeah. burn the window down burners. It just got kind of ridiculous. Yo, that is uh, crazy. Yeah. See, like, listen, don't do the history, guys. The podcasts are there. These, these, these names and letters. These are these are legendary, legendary moments in graph history. What? Yes. Uh, there's something really charming about a uh, a window down. To be fair, like the Lee Slave piece, like it's um, it's compact and like you say, it's not uh, evasive, is it? It's uh, right. You know, you're going even though on the window down, you're going to go somewhere on the windows. Mm. But it's just the the thoughts you put into it, to, to, the movement of the letters, the arrows, mm. the connections. It's just something when you finish and you step back and look at it, you just feel so proud of what you did, mm. you know. And when you when then when when it pulls out on Monday morning and you see it and it's nice and fresh, oh, there's no better feeling in the world than that. And again, don't try this at home, kids. It's not the one. <laughs> That yeah. that that though sounds very um, immersive, and uh, your endorphin levels just must have been through the roof. Yes. So if you see your piece, and after rush hour, now you you just want to go and get more pay. So now we go racking again, and mm-hmm. doing it all over again. And you were a star in the hood. You guys were stars yeah. in New York. This was oh yes. You know, Lee ended up, you know, being a superstar and wild style getting into like amazing galleries and you know fab right. five you know <laughs> even freddie adopted your name it's like you guys were superstars man yeah but from the beginning he was an artist that i never knew because i've been to his house so many times and had a picture on the wall in a frame of bruce lee till one day when it fell 
and and the frame opened up, then I realized that it was a, a pencil drawing of Bruce Lee. That's when I really knew he was an artist. All the time, I thought it was a photograph. Wow. For years, for years, I'm looking at this picture thought it was a photograph. <sighs> He's an amazing artist. Ain't nothing, because one time I was at Brooklyn Bridge at a train station, it, it has a curve when it's coming in. Mm -hmm. he, he sat right there, we was at the bench, and he had a paper and pencil, and he drew the train station right there in front of me. Stop the curve it. and everything. I mean, exactly how it was. That's incredible. Yeah, he's an artist. He's a pure artist. It's very rare you find a, a person that transfers those levels of attention and skill set into the big screen, into the museums and exhibitions, into just daily life, like that tenaciousness to want to cycle all the way down to Florida or, you know, hang right. off a train and do a burner while it's moving. Right. You know, this is some other levels, right? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, and I bet, uh, you, know, you know, I can only imagine Fab Five flourished through the expertise of him and, and the, the other four plus, right? Right. Because uh, one thing, what it was, it was everybody seemed to lead you whole cars with like, kind of like straight letters. Mm. But, but then when he did cars with me with, with style letters, everybody was kind of shocked. They didn't know that he could do that too. Mm. So everybody was really impressed with him after that. Incredible. Incredible. Yeah. Brother, what's the future? What's the future? Well, I'm, I'm, I, I was doing counseling for a while. Then I stopped for a while, but um, I'm starting back on doing some counseling, paying some counseling. I got Fantastic. one right here that I'm sure. working on. Right, if you're not watching and you're listening, you're about to show us some canvas. Can you see this? Oh, what I'm starting on right now. Whoa, down a tiny bit, just a tiny bit. Do, do, do. Oh, yo, that's hard. Yo, that's yeah, that's the classic. That's the formula right there, right? So for those of you listening, it says the right. fabulous, and then there's like an eight ball that says five. Hard. Right. Yeah. That is looking yeah. sick. How many are you going to do? Thank you. I don't know. I bought a bunch of, I bought a pack of cameras. I got like 12 cameras. So I'm going to start, start doing cameras here and then. So that, you know, when I come with an idea, I want to do it. Well, it's critical, it's critical yeah. then that people follow you on Instagram, right? It's, yeah. What's your Instagram? Um, I think it's a Kenneth the Ramp Fabulous Five. I think that's what it says. I'm not sure. But if you if you put in Slay or Fabulous Five or put in Slay mm -hmm. Fabulous Five, it should come up. That's the ticket. That's the ticket, right. my brother. So the, the the canvases are the canvases are out on the on the combat they about working. They're they're in progress. Yes. I'll post them as soon as I'm done with them. Yeah. Post them one by one. That is so sick. The original formula landed on canvas ASAP. Wow. All right. Slave, it's been a pleasure having you on here, brother. Hey, I enjoyed every minute of it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and Merry More, Merry More podcasts in the future. I'd hope to see you on here real soon once you got them canvases up and running. Definitely. I'd appreciate the invite when I get everything going. Yeah, man. We'll have some more stories. we we'll get some more stories out the vaults. Definitely. Slave Fab Five. Thank you so much, my man. Killer Keller Podcast. I like him was out of fashion. Hey, that one basic. Hey, we don't do basic around here, all right? Sharing is <laughs> <laughs> Tell a friend to tell a friend, okay? We don't do this for our health. We do it for you. Do it for the culture. Do it for the people and do it for the creatives, all right? You stay lucky. Peace. All right. Thanks a lot. <laughs>